But let's move on. Ron introduces Harry and Hermione to a radio program he learned about while he was away from them called Potter Watch. It's the only program that tells the truth about what's going on. One day, in March, Ron is finally able to access it on the radio again, and the trio listen in. It turns out the host of Potter Watch is none other than Lee Jordan, using the codename River. The first thing he announces, to their horror, are the murders of Ted Tonks, Dirk Cresswell, and the Goblin Gornuck. As I mentioned, this announcement was played in the background far earlier in the movie. Fortunately, as Lee announces, Dean and Griphook manage to get away. He then announces the murder of a family of five muggles. As he says, muggle slaughter has now become little more than a recreational sport. Finally, he announces that the remains of Bethilda Bagshot were found in her home. Well, we know all about that one. After a moment of silence for the dead, Lee calls on two guests, codenamed Royal and Romulus, Kingsley and Lupin, respectively. Kingsley talks about how the new magical regime is affecting the muggle world. Muggles continue to die in masses, though unaware of why. However, apparently several witches and wizards have been risking their own safety to protect their muggle neighbors, and Kingsley asks people to follow their example. And what would you say, Royal, to those listeners who reply that in these dangerous times it should be wizards first? I'd say that it's one short step from wizards first to purebloods first, and then to death eaters. We're all human, aren't we? Every human life is worth the same and worth saving. Excellently put, Royal. You've got my vote for Minister for Magic if ever we get out of this mess. Lupin then talks about Harry, beginning with his certainty that he's still alive and how he symbolizes everything they're fighting for. And what would you say to Harry if you knew he was listening, Romulus? I'd tell him that we're all with him in spirit, and I'd tell him to follow his instincts, which are good and nearly always right. Clearly he's forgiven Harry after their fight back in Grim Old Place. Lupin then talks about people who have paid for their allegiance to Harry. Xenophilius Lovegood has been imprisoned, he wasn't killed so Hermione's plan worked, and apparently Hagrid has had to go into hiding after he hosted a support Harry Potter party in his hut. I love Hagrid, but he's not exactly the brightest. Lee brings on one more guest, Fred, codenamed Rapier, though Lee initially uses Rodent by accident. Fred talks about the rumors surrounding Voldemort and urges people to stop making up crazy conspiracy theories as it just spreads panic. He does seem to confirm that Voldemort is out of the country right now, but warns everyone in a rather hilarious way not to let that lure them into a false sense of security. Boy, do people don't get lulled into a false sense of security thinking he's out of the country. Maybe he is, maybe he isn't, but the fact remains he could move faster than Severus Snape confronted with shampoo when he wants to. The program ends, and it seems to have actually made Harry briefly forget his obsession with the Deathly Hallows. Just hearing friendly voices again had a hugely positive effect on him. However, his obsession comes back when he brings up Fred's words, Voldemort to out of the country, clearly still looking for the Elder Wand. And in his excitement, Harry slips up and says Voldemort's name. Within no time, their tent is surrounded by Snatchers. So yeah, that's how they're found in the book. An error in a moment of extreme emotion. Much more believable than them just happening to apparate right to the Snatchers. So in the movie, there's a whole chase sequence here, but in the book, they're pretty much surrounded to begin with, so they can't run anywhere. I do like the choice of having no music during the chase. It makes it feel all the more scary and intense. In both versions, however, Hermione hits Harry with a spell, making his head swell up so he's unrecognizable. Now in the movie, this is where Harry has the vision of Voldemort interrogating Grindelwald about the whereabouts of the Elder Wand. In the book, it happens in bits and pieces as the next sequence plays, so I'll talk about it a bit later. I definitely have thoughts on it, though. So the Snatchers round up the trio, and I like how the movie kept the detail of Ron running to Hermione's defense here. Now one change that I'm not sure why they made is that in the book, Fenrir Greyback is the leader of these Snatchers, and Scabior is his second in command. Whereas in the movie, it seems to be the opposite, as Scabior is the one taking charge and has all of Greyback's lines. Again, Greyback's whole character was really pushed to the background in the movies for some reason. So the trio give fake names. Vernon Dudley. Penelope Clearwater. Which was the name of Percy's girlfriend back in Chamber of Secrets. And Ron uses Barney Weasley, which was the fake name they gave to Harry when he was in disguise at the wedding. Greyback also displays a really disturbing hunger for Hermione specifically. 
Now, one other thing the movie cuts out is that the Snatchers already have two prisoners, Dean and Griphook. In the movie, Dean was apparently never captured, and Griphook just shows up in the dungeon of the Malfoy Manor. I guess I get the reasoning behind this change as it simplifies things without taking away too much, but I don't know. I've always kind of liked Dean's presence here, as he's always been more of an interchangeable side character, and this lets him stand out a bit more. Harry does manage to convince the Snatchers that he's a Slytherin, when he's able to perfectly describe the Slytherin common room and how to get in there, thanks to his and Ron's experience in Chamber of Secrets. Unfortunately, it doesn't stick, as the Snatchers suddenly recognize Hermione from a picture in The Prophet and put two and two together about who Harry is. Since the Ministry would likely take all the credit for the capture, Greyback decides to take the prisoners to Malfoy Manor and have them summon Voldemort from there. He can't summon him himself, because unlike the other Death Eaters, he hasn't been given a dark mark. In the movie, Bellatrix greets them at the gate, but in the book, she doesn't show up right away. At first, it's only the Malfoys who are present in the drawing room, and Narcissa is the one taking charge. I understand why the movie decided to make it Bellatrix, as she's a more familiar character to us, but it would have been nice to see Helen McCrory get more to do in these movies. Regardless, in both versions, they ask Draco to verify Harry's identity. After all, if they call Voldemort and it's not Harry, they're all going to be in big trouble. Draco is oddly reluctant to identify Harry, and Lucius tries to persuade him to do so, as if they're the ones to hand Harry over, all their past failures will be forgiven. I have to say, Jason Isaacs does a great job here. Lucius is clearly desperate and hopeful, but still with an air of trying to cling to his old authority. Now, we won't be forgetting who actually caught him. I hope, Mr. Malfoy. You dare to talk to me like that in my own house? Yes. Narcissa knows that the wand Harry was using doesn't match the description given by Ollivander, a point against this being Harry, but then she recognizes Hermione from Madame Malkin's when they met there, and Lucius recognizes Ron. Draco, however, determinedly keeps his back to both of them so as to avoid having to confirm their identities. Now, in the book, this is where Bellatrix comes in. Upon seeing that they captured the trio, she gleefully whips out her dark mark to contact her master, but Lucius, wanting to be the one to contact Contact him, stops her, and they fight over who should get to do it, until Bellatrix sees the sword in one of the Snatcher's hands. At this, she completely freaks out and orders the others not to summon Voldemort. Snape had sent the sword to her vault in Gringotts, so now she's terrified that the trio have been in her vault. Of course, it was actually the fake sword he sent, but she doesn't know that. Bellatrix attacks the Snatchers and takes the sword from them, and in the book orders Draco to take all of them, except Greyback out of the house. In the movie, she just sent all of them away. Narcissa even stands up to her sister for a moment, telling her not to give her son orders, but Bellatrix shouts her down. Narcissa orders Greyback to throw the prisoners in the dungeon while they discuss what to do, but Bellatrix says to leave Hermione so she can question her. Reckon she'll let me have a bit of the girl when she's finished with her? I'd say I'll get a bite or two, wouldn't you, Ginger? Now, throughout all of this, Harry has been having flashes of Voldemort's perspective as he flies to the prison Nurmengard and interrogates Gellert Grindelwald in his cell. I suppose now is as good a time as any to talk about this scene. Parts of this I think the movie did well. I like how Grindelwald is completely unafraid of Voldemort and how he calls him Tom, just as Dumbledore did. However, there is one major problem with it. In the movie, Grindelwald gleefully tells Voldemort that the Elder Wand is with Dumbledore. The Elder Wand lies with him, of course, buried in the earth. Dumbledore. In the book, however, Grindelwald refuses to talk and denies he ever had it. On top of that, he mocks Voldemort every step of the way. Kill me then, Voldemort. I welcome death. But my death will not bring you what you seek. There is so much you do not understand. I mean, this guy has no access to magic right now, yet he's laughing in Voldemort's face. And it really highlights the difference between these two. Even Grindelwald, one of the most powerful and infamous dark wizards of all time, was able to reflect on and feel some degree of remorse for his crimes, and still clings to some lingering affection for his old friend Dumbledore, even though Dumbledore was the one who put him in prison. His refusal to tell Voldemort where the Elder Wand is, is both a means of making up for his actions in some small way, and to prevent his old friend's tomb from being desecrated. A stark contrast to Voldemort, who is thoroughly unrepentant and incapable of love. 
This partly comes down to the fact that Grindelwald was fighting for ideals he truly believed in, twisted as they may have been, whereas Voldemort only cares about himself, and even his cause is just an excuse to seize more power. Now, this one act is of course not enough to redeem Grindelwald for his numerous horrific crimes, and Voldemort will figure out where the Elder Wand is on his own anyway, but it still makes him seem more human and shows that even the worst of people can change if given time to reflect. Voldemort would never gain the same wisdom to look inward and embrace death. Ironically, by welcoming his own end, Grindelwald would finally become Master of Death, just as he always wanted. I'm disappointed that they decided to change this so completely in the movie. Especially now that we've actually seen more of Grindelwald in the Fantastic Beasts films, it makes me sad that non-readers will never know that he had this change of heart. The only way I can make the movie version of this scene better in my head is if I imagine that Grindelwald figured out that Dumbledore had a plan that involved Voldemort getting the Elder Wand, and that's why he was so quick to tell Voldemort. He is smart enough and knows Dumbledore well enough to figure that out. Another change made to this scene is that Voldemort doesn't even kill Grindelwald in the movie. He just leaves after getting the info. In the book, after Grindelwald has successfully pushed all of his buttons, Voldemort kills him in anger. Which was exactly what Grindelwald wanted anyway. Also, and this is a nitpick, is it just me or does Grindelwald look a little too generic? I don't know, I would have expected a bit more of a distinctive look for him. At least the Fantastic Beasts movies gave him one. So moving on, Harry, Ron, Dean, and Griphook are thrown in the dungeon as Bellatrix tortures Hermione above. Now, I'm just gonna say right off the bat, Ron is way too subdued in the movie when he hears Hermione scream. In the book, he can't stop shouting her name at the top of his lungs. He keeps punching the wall and tears pour from his eyes. In the movie, he's just like, We have to do something. I do like that the movie actually shows Bellatrix torturing Hermione, and it's not just using the Cruciatus Curse. It's honestly a little frightening. And I like the touch of her carving the word mudblood into Hermione's arm. So after being thrown into the dungeon, the group find that they are not alone down there. Luna is there as well, along with Mr. Ollivander, who in the book is just curled up on the floor. I like that they let John Hurt actually stand in the movie. And as I mentioned, in the movie, Griphook is already there, whereas he came in with the trio in the book, and Dean isn't present in the movie at all. So of course, Harry sees what looks like Dumbledore's eye in his mirror fragment, and again, I prefer this in the book. In the movie, he deliberately takes it out of his sock, like he knows it'll be able to help them. How did he know? In the book, he's just desperately going through his things, and as he takes out the mirror fragment, he happens to see the eye. Even when he asks for help, in the book, Harry specifically says that they're in the cellar of Malfoy Manor. In the movie, he just says, Help us. That's it. So how did Aberforth know where they were? From above, they hear Hermione lie that the sword they have is the fake one, so Bellatrix sends for Griphook to confirm this. In the movie, Wormtail is the one to come get him, but in the book, it's Draco. And before Draco arrives, Harry quickly runs over to Griphook and begs him to lie and say the sword is fake. Thankfully, Griphook does end up doing as Harry asked. After Griphook is led from the cellar, Dobby of course shows up, having been sent, as we later learn, by Aberforth. Harry and Ron have him take Luna, Dean, and Mr. Ollivander to Shell Cottage, where Bill and Fleur live, and then come back once they're safe. Though Luna and Dean initially protest, wanting to stay and help, Harry talks them into going. By the way, I love the dialogue the movie added to this part. Are you saying you can operate in and out of this room? Could you take us with you? Of course, I, I'm an elf. Looks to me. Whenever you're ready, sir. Sir, I like her very much. Hearing the sound of Dobby disapparating, the Malfoys send Wormtail to investigate. Now, in the movie, Dobby simply stuns Wormtail from behind after he opens the door, knocking him out. And that's the last we see of him. The reason for this is because in the book, he actually dies here. As he enters, Harry and Ron tackle him. Ron takes his wand, and Pettigrew starts strangling Harry with his silver hand. However, when Harry reminds him that he owes Harry his life, Pettigrew hesitates, and sensing this moment of weakness, the silver hand moves of its own accord towards Pettigrew's throat and starts strangling him. Harry and Ron try to pull it away, but it's no use, and Pettigrew is strangled to death. As one might expect, this was not a gift Voldemort was giving him. It was an insurance policy against any lack of loyalty in the future. 
If I'm going to be 100% honest, I always kind of thought this was a bit of an anticlimactic end to his character. I mean, this is the guy who betrayed Harry's parents. I expected a lot more to be done with him, but after he helped bring Voldemort back, he mostly vanished from the story, except for a minor appearance here and there, and didn't really contribute anything. It seems like the story would have been affected very little if Voldemort had just let him bleed out in the graveyard. And on top of that, at the end of Prisoner of Azkaban, Dumbledore was talking about how Pettigrew was in Harry's debt and said, Pettigrew owes his life to you. You have sent Voldemort a deputy who is in your debt. When one wizard saves another wizard's life, it creates a certain bond between them. And I'm much mistaken if Voldemort wants his servant in the debt of Harry Potter. The time may come when you will be very glad you saved Pettigrew's life. Well, okay, the debt thing kind of paid off, I suppose. But I don't see what about any of this would make Harry glad he saved Pettigrew, especially considering Pettigrew helped bring Voldemort back. In my eyes, he did nothing to make saving him worth it. I mean, yeah, there is the fact that Sirius and Lupin didn't become murderers, which is good. But again, you may be glad you saved him? I'm not saying he would have to be redeemed or anything, but I really felt like Rowling was setting up something more substantial with that line than what we got. That could well just be me, though. Because of all this, I just can't bring myself to be too upset to see that part cut. Even though, yeah, him simply being knocked out is even more of an anticlimax. So Harry and Ron leave the cell and head upstairs to rescue Hermione and Griphook. In the book, we see Griphook lie and say the sword is fake, like Harry asked him. At this, Bellatrix is overcome with relief and uses her dark mark to summon Voldemort, which is different in the movie where they never get a chance to summon him. Incidentally, Voldemort is in the process of interrogating Grindelwald when she summons him, and I think the interruption, coupled with Grindelwald's own jabs, contributes to the anger that leads him to kill Grindelwald. Voldemort then starts flying in the direction of the manor, which adds more of a sense of urgency here as the trio have to escape quickly before he arrives. Bellatrix gives Greyback permission to feast on Hermione, and like in the movie, the threat on Hermione's life triggers Ron to leap into action, and a fight breaks out. It plays out pretty much the same in both versions, with Ron disarming Bellatrix, Harry catching her wand and taking out Lucius, and then the two of them fighting with Draco and Narcissa. The only difference is, in the book, they're fighting Greyback as well. Bellatrix stops the fight by holding Hermione at knife point and has Draco take the wands from Harry and Ron. In the movie, she orders Draco to summon Voldemort, and when he hesitates, Lucius steps up and starts to do it instead. I almost wonder if he's trying to protect his son here, so if things go wrong, Draco won't get the blame for bothering Voldemort. Well, in any case, this doesn't happen in the book, as Voldemort has already been summoned and Lucius is still unconscious. Dobby returns to save the day by dropping the chandelier over Bellatrix. By the way, Warwick Davis seems to have lost his goblin makeup here. And from here, it plays out more or less the same as in the book, the only difference being after Harry takes the three wands from Draco, in the book he uses all three of them to send Greyback flying up to the ceiling and crashing back down on the floor. Oh, and I guess the other thing is that in the book, Griphook is barely conscious here since he was in range of the falling chandelier, and Harry has to carry him and the sword over to Dobby. So Harry actually directly saved him in the book. The movie does add yet another great piece of dialogue for Dobby here, though. You could've killed me! Dobby never meant to kill. Dobby only meant to maim or seriously injure. So after Bellatrix expresses her outrage that Dobby would defy his master, Dobby declares himself a free elf and disapparates, taking the trio and Griphook to Shell Cottage. But not before Bellatrix throws her knife, which hits him squarely in the chest. Now I don't really have a problem with this scene on its own. Dobby does talk a bit more here than in the book. That's a beautiful place. To be with friends. Dobby is happy to be with his friend, Harry Potter. In the book, all he says is, Harry Potter. I don't mind them extending it, though. In all honesty, this scene as it is, is done well. The reason it doesn't work so well is the fault of the previous movies, not this one. I've already mentioned this several times, but by removing Dobby from the last three films, his death ends up feeling a bit cheaper. 
We only really saw him in Chamber of Secrets, where, in all honesty, he was more of a hindrance than a help. And now he returns in this film only to die. In the books, he's been consistently present throughout, and Chamber of Secrets aside, he's been nothing but helpful to Harry. And now he's directly saved his life, only to lose his own. His death hit really hard in the book. Sadly, it just doesn't have the same effect in the movie. Though through no fault of this movie. So Bill, Fleur, Dean, and Luna run up to them, and in the movie, Luna closes Dobby's eyes so it looks like he's sleeping. This happens a bit later in the book, after the hole has been dug. Speaking of which, Harry announces his intention to bury Dobby. I want to bury him. Properly. Without magic. And he does so. And shortly afterwards, he had set to work, alone, digging the grave in the place that Bill had shown him at the end of the garden between bushes. He dug with a kind of fury, relishing the manual work, glorying in the non-magic of it. For every drop of his sweat and every blister felt like a gift to the elf who had saved their lives. In the book, Harry also feels his scar burn during this as Voldemort punishes Bellatrix and the Malfoys. But his grief for Dobby overrides it and allows him to resist seeing through Voldemort's eyes. Like Dumbledore said, love pushes Voldemort out. Also in the book, Ron and Dean come out to help him dig. Hermione, after being tortured, needs to be cared for by Fleur. And when they're done, Dean conjures a hat to put on Dobby. Then they each say their farewell words to Dobby, or rather, Luna does. Thank you so much, Dobby, for rescuing me from that cellar. It's unfair that you had to die when you were so good and brave. I'll always remember what you did for us. I hope you're happy now. The others just say thanks or goodbye, since Luna pretty much summed it up. As the others head back to the cottage, Harry stays behind and places a stone on the grave, using Draco's wand to carve the words, Here lies Dobby, a free elf. The movie then ends with Voldemort going to and breaking open Dumbledore's grave, taking the Elder Wand from his corpse and triumphantly firing lightning in the air. A cool cliffhanger ending for part one. So yeah, all in all a pretty cool movie that captures the tone of the book quite well, and the split gave it far more room to breathe than previous movies. Unfortunately, there were still a lot of plot points they had to hit that meant that some of the most important and interesting parts of the book fell by the wayside. In particular, Dumbledore's past and Harry's obsession with the Hallows, both of which are really important to Harry's character arc and the journey he's on. It's also, as I mentioned, an incomplete story by the very nature of it being split into two movies, and requires watching part two to complete it. Join me there to discuss the grand finale of the Harry Potter saga.